We're Sig Honk, and this is Malicious Compliance, Reflections on Trusting Container Scanners. If you're here for malicious compliance, hey, so are we. If you're not here for malicious compliance, you're in the wrong room, but we're happy to see you anyway. I'm Brad Giesemann, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm a staff security engineer at Ghost Security, and I enjoy hacking cloud and Kubernetes with my friends here. I'm Ian Coldwater, pronouns they, them. I'm an independent security researcher, a longtime community organizer, and SIG security co-chair. I love hacking weird machines and bringing people together, and I'm looking for work, if you're hiring. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rory McCune. My programs are he, him. I, I'm a senior security advocate with Datadog, and I like to learn about security and write blogs. Hey, everybody. I'm Duffy Cooley. I'm the field CTO at Isovalent, where I get to work on things like Cilium and Tetragon and eBPF. I'm excited to be here with all of you in person, and I'm especially excited that we are all here, finally, for all, those, all together on the same stage. Um, that's cool. Oh, clickers. Why is that doing that? One second. Then we'll go OK, on. I'm going to go drive this over here. So SIG Honk isn't an official Kubernetes SIG. We're a hacker crew who have been poking at Kubernetes for years, and we work together to share attacker perspectives and help the whole community level up. So why are we here today? We have a question for all of you, real quick. Who here has ever heard of containers? Love it. We had a feeling. By another show of hands, who here has ever used a container vulnerability scanner before? Wow, OK, great. Perfect. So one thing you might have noticed is that governments, auditors, and your security teams are asking you to scan all of your container images for vulnerabilities so that you're more secure. But we don't hear as much about the details. And as it turns out, the details are important. So what do container scanners actually do? And what problems do they solve? And how do container scanners work? Are they all the same? Can you always trust the results? Let's find out. In this talk, we'll be mainly covering four widely used container scanners. We chose Trivi, Gripe, Docker Scan, and Docker Scout to test. But what we'll be covering here isn't necessarily limited to those four. As of April 13th of this year, Docker Scan has been deprecated to be replaced by Docker Scout. Docker Scan is powered by Sneak on the back end, which we thought was interesting. And a lot of people still use it, so we figured we'd still include it here today. So to start, let's use all four of these scanners to scan a vulnerable container image we created and see what results we get. So let's show the versions of each of the scanners that we're using today, just for posterity. So we have Trivi, right? Docker Scan, and Docker Scout. So let's cat our base Docker file. As you can see, we're using a slightly old base image. It's uh, Composer 1.72. So it's got a couple of vulnerabilities we know that, that are in there. And it's based on Alpine 3.7. The next thing we're going to do is install Node.js. Then we're going to copy in some runtime dependency files. So things like gem file lock, package JSON, yarn.lock, et cetera. And lastly, at the bottom, you'll see we copy in kube control. It's relatively recent, but it's not quite up to date. And that's a Go binary. So let's quickly build the base image and scan, this, scan the image with Trivi, Gripe, Docker Scan, and Docker Scout. Now let's check, check the results in a summary format. There, we got some findings. But let's see that on a graphical display. So this is our baseline set of results. And immediately we can see that the four different scanners trained on the same image produce wildly different numbers of results. Why is that? Well, it turns out they don't always work the same way. Let's break it down a little bit. So how do con container vulnerability scanners work? Is it magic pixie dust? Nah. They work on a combination of several techniques that we'll have a look through now. Back over here, I guess. 
So files that hold operating system version metadata and release information, like Etsy OS release, Etsy LSB release, and Etsy Alpine release, are typically one of the first things scanners look to to help inform them for their approach to scanning the rest of the base image. From there, container scanners also flag up outdated versions of packages provided by your Linux distribution. This is based on the scanner using the package database that's installed by the distribution and the security database that contains vulnerability information. One thing that's worth being aware of is that in some cases there are OS package vulnerabilities for which there is no available patch. And the scanner can be told to either report them or not, depending on your risk appetite. And another thing to think about here is this means the scanner needs to understand the package database for your distribution. So if you use a new or a niche distribution, it might not be supported. Some of these scanners also look for software language dependency files, such as package.json, requirements.txt, or cargo.lock. This use of the word cargo has not been endorsed by the Rust Foundation. These files contain information related to libraries and metadata, which the scanners use to find vulnerabilities in software dependencies. Another thing that some scanners look for is any metadata embedded in binaries. Golang since 117 embeds dependency data inside of the Go binary, and Rust binaries can be scanned in the same way. So now that we've talked about how these tools come up with findings, let's go back and look a little bit closer at our base image one more time, the results. So looking at the results again, you can see that we've broken them up into three different classes of finding. OS package, dependency file, and binary metadata. And you can see that the numbers found per category for each individual scanner are wildly different, as well as the total numbers of results. I mean, that's a lot of findings. There's at least 90 or more results that, that we have to go through, and fixing all of them is going to take a really long time. To be fair, some of these specific findings could likely be resolved by updating our base image. Since we used an older one on purpose for the purposes of demonstration, but it's not always that simple. Many of these findings are related to dependencies in the software itself, and this can create compounding issues. Updating dependencies can change the, software, can change the software's behavior, and it may need to be modified to handle the change in dependencies. And it's not just the one-time fix. We have to deal with this every time we have to update dependencies, every time there's a new base image, every time new CVEs are learned about. There's just a ton of things that can actually trigger having to go back through this. And if this base image is actually from a vendor, fixing it may not even be an option. OK, so let's say that we're the team who's responsible for this image, and it's currently deployed as a core component in our production environment right now. The security team just sent us these scan results, and now we can't ship again until they're fixed. Fixing all the findings that were raised means updating several components and maybe retesting our entire application. So we're taking a risk of breaking production just by trying to do the right thing and actually fix them. And that brings us to a choice. What do we do about this? If we fix all of these findings to be compliant, we'll miss our deadline. If we ship on time without fixing them, we'll get into trouble with the auditors. None of those options are very good. There's got to be a better way. So we need to address these scan results to be compliant, but that sounds like a lot of work. Is there something we could do to just make the findings go away? I have an idea. Now that we know what the scanners are looking for, let's use a systematic approach to see if we can hide or bypass detection for every single finding for all of the scanners with no breaking changes to our containerized application. If we can do that, the next scan results will be compliant our app will still work, and we can still ship it and make our deadline. So remember when we said that the scanners can use the OS release information to figure out which operating system version the image is based on and that can, how that can guide their approach to scanning the image? What if we made a report that it was an operating system and version the scanners have never seen before by changing the name and just deleting that information entirely? Let's see what would happen. So we're going to take that same original Docker file, and we're going to change a couple things. First thing we're going to do is make it look like it's our own custom distribution of Linux. 
and overwriting Etsy OS release. Then we're gonna delete Etsy LSB release and Etsy Alpine release just to make sure it doesn't get confused, okay? So let's rescan the image. First, we have to build it, sorry, so we can incorporate all those changes. We're gonna rescan the image. Trivi, right, Docker scan, and Docker scout. Let's take a look at the results. Interesting, some things have changed here. All right, let's go back to the graph so it's a little bit easier to see. We can now see that Docker Scan and Docker Scout immediately stopped reporting operating system package issues. I mean, that's pretty wild, right? All from just changing or removing a couple of files. All right, that's pretty sweet. Clearly, things have been improved, but I think we can do better. That one took care of those findings from Docker Scan and Docker Scout, but can we get the other scanners to no longer see findings from OS packages either? So if changing or deleting the OS release metadata worked before, we should also try to get rid of the OS packaging metadata for the installed operating system packages. That shouldn't have any effect on our application working, but it will prevent the scanners from seeing that information. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back into our Docker file and we're going to make another change. We're going to delete the Alpine OS package metadata. So down the bottom, what you can see here is we've got a couple of lines that just do an RM minus RF on ETC APK and lib APK, which is where that data lives. Then what we'll do is we'll rebuild our image again because we need to make sure we're getting the latest version. And that'll go away and do it. And then what we've done now is we can now run our scanners. So we'll scan the image with Trivi, with Gripe, with Docker Scan and with Docker Scout. Let's see what kind of effect that change had. Wow, if you look at that left column there, which is OS packages, that's fantastic. We don't have any vulnerabilities anymore. <laughs> so. so that's a great change. Let's look at them in graphical format. So this is how many we started out with, to remind everybody, and this is how many we've got now. So now, all four scanners no longer show any OS package vulnerability findings. But let's be clear, the results are gone, but we didn't actually uninstall any packages. They're still in the image. It looks to me like we're still seeing results from some of the scanners relating to software dependency files, like gem locks and those sorts of things. So our next stop should probably be to try and get rid of those. So. We know the scanners are looking for specific files with specific file names that hold software dependencies used by languages like JavaScript, Python, Ruby, and others. So how are the scanners going about looking for those? Are they just looking for the file names? Because if so, I wonder if they would try to follow a symlink. In order for our application in this image to still work, we can't change the names of files like package.json and gemfile.lock, but what if we renamed the files themselves to something else and then made symlinks to them with the original names? Let's try it. So we're going to take that original Docker file, but this time we're going to copy in all of those files with a different name. Then we're going to make symlinks to link them to the original file name so that when the application tries to look for a file like package.json, it just follows the symlink to the renamed file and the app will still work. We also went ahead and deleted some Python egg info metadata files because we don't really need them, so why not? So let's build that modified image now. And then let's scan it with all four scanners again. And now, let's take a look at the results. All right. <laughs> so to reiterate, we haven't actually deleted anything. We've just made the scanners not see it anymore. But let's take a look at these results again in graphical form. Oops, shit. That's all right. Okay. That's all right. 
it's fine, it's all fine. Okay. Again, reminder, this is how many we started out with in the first place. And this is how many we've got now. So that worked. It's clear that the scanners do not always follow the sim links. And that made them find not, not find any issues in the software dependency files. And, you know, this kind of makes sense. Sim links have a rich history of being tricky to get right. For a good example of that, you can actually see our previous talk about kubelet vulnerabilities, a slightly peculiar volume configuration from KubeCon NA 2021. All right, so it looks like we still have a few findings left, and they're all related to issues with binaries. Ah, remember that in, some, in uh, binaries, the metadata can be embedded inside of it. So I wonder how we can get the scanners to not see that stuff. Let's find out. So what can we do about all of these binaries? Have you ever heard about UPX packing? It's a way of compressing binaries, and it also happens to obfuscate the internal structure of the binary itself. This makes it very useful for things like making binaries smaller and mm, avoiding malware detection. So let's see what happens if we UPX pack all of the binaries. So let's modify the Docker file again. We're installing UPX as a package so we can pack some of these binaries and apply that same symlink and rename technique against one of the Python shared libraries. And we're going to pack both kubectl and busybox to see if that gets rid of all the binary issues. So let's build that modified image again. Now we're going to rescan the image with all four scanners. And then let's check out the results. <laughs> that was very effective, mostly, but we still have a few findings left. Let's take a look at that graph again. Again, this is the original amount that we had, and this is how many we have now. There's still more to unpack here. Three of them are still finding issues with the Golang binary kubectl. That's interesting, though, because that should have gotten rid of all the findings, right? Well, one thing we do know is that container images are built of layers. Perhaps they're looking in the layers. Right. But is there some way to make it so the scanners can't see all the layers? I mean, we are shooting for 100% compliance, right? I mean, we could try a multi-stage build. Let's try that. So we're going to edit our Docker file one more time. And we can see that this Docker file is a bit of a mess. There's lots and lots of things that we're doing here, lots and lots of layers that we're adding, and lots of layers also that we're inheriting from the composer image as well. So up here at the top, I've just decided to call all of this work as builder. And here down at the bottom, I've got my from scratch and copy two lines. So <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and separate those build and the obfuscation steps and the final packaging steps. And we are also going to copy in an ICAR sample test file into the image, overriding bin bash. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Where's that line? Here we go. That's where we're copying it in. <clears throat> we're going to talk about that here in a little bit later. So all of the, when we do this, when we do this step of actually um, a, a multi-stage build, we end up with a single layer image that is the artifact that we're going to ship. And this will result in a couple of interesting things. When we build this new modified image and we compare the size against the previous one, we can see that the old one was 306 meg and this new one is 166 meg. So, Big win, right? Easier to distribute, all that stuff. It's good stuff. Our image is a bit smaller, and any image that uses this one might also make, make get benefit from some of the modifications that we've made. So let's go ahead and rescan these things. And see what we see here. View the results. So let's put that back in the graph form. That's where so, we started. 
how it started, how it's going. And we did it. We are completely 100% compliant. I mean, we haven't changed anything about this image, I mean, other than like how we build it and that sort of stuff. Um, so all of those findings in the first graph are all still in there. They're just not alerting anymore. OK, so this is exciting. We've managed to get to zero findings on this old image just by taking things out. But how about adding stuff in? Could we sneak anything malicious in there and still be compliant? <laughs> well, we already did. None of these scanners picked up the addition of iCar because none of these scanners are going to look for malware or file changes. If we want something that might pick that kind of thing up, we might need to use a different approach. What about something that generated an inventory of all software and dependencies in the image? Like an S-bomb? The White House and other governments have said that we all need to use S-bombs to know everything that's in our software. So SBOM stands for Software Bill of Materials, which at a high level is a document, often JSON formatted, with a goal of telling users what's in their software, or in our case, a container image. So surely an SBOM would have to show us if there was something malicious that had been added to our container, right? Well, let's find out. We can use Trivia and SIF to generate some SBOMs for our images, and then use Trivia and Gripe to scan those SBOM documents for vulnerability results. SBOMs have a couple of different formats, but in this demo, we're going to be using these tools to output them in SPDX JSON. So let's go ahead and generate SBOMs for the original base image, our starting image, and our multi stage build image. We're going to use Trivi and SIFT. And SIFT and Gripe work together. They're both made by Ancor. So SIFT generates the SBOM, and Gripe scans that SBOM but Trivi scans Trivi. So let's look at our SBOM results. And right away, you can see something's up, because in our base images, the file sizes are quite large, and in our multi-stage build images, those files are kind of tiny. So let's dive into those. So if we look at the SIFT SBOM for the original base image, we can see, this is the SPDX format, by the way, it's just a lot of JSON. So if you love JSON, you can see it captures all the packages, Right, they're all there. And captures some of the files, including bin bash. But you remember, we copied ICAR on top of bin bash. But what do we see for the SHA hash? All zeros. That's interesting, right? So let's look at Trivi's SBOM for the original base image. And as you can see, similar format, SPDX, but there's only one file shown, and all of that metadata is in the packages. So right away, you can tell that they're not quite exactly right, and they're not quite uh, compatible. And lastly, we'll look at Trivi's SBOM for that multi-stage build image, the one that we had zero findings for. And this is how long that document is. That's it. That's the final SBOM. So if we look at a Trivi SBOM generated for the multi-stage build, you can see that's pretty light. And there aren't a lot of results there, which is incredibly interesting. But yeah. did it pick up anything malicious of ours? No, as it turns out. All the same obfuscation techniques still work to hide the findings from being reported from the S-bombs. So all that work worked. And again, we still haven't changed anything about the software in our image. And this really calls out how important it is to understand how these tools work. This SBOM records that there are no vulnerabilities in the image. And we've shown you that that's not true. That's okay. Which doesn't stop this image and the associated SBOM from being considered compliant. A few of these techniques are legitimate things that probably some of you have used during, to manage the life cycle of your images in the past. I mean, who hasn't built a multi-stage build at this point? You, probably, you perhaps did not know that you were being maliciously compliant at the time. And this stuff is hard. And even if it is compliant, it's definitely not secure. Yeah. The demo gods are not smiling upon us today, so we're going to go backwards one slide. So 
one interesting thing we found is that the results are not always consistent between when some of these scanners scan images directly and when they scan SBOMs generated from the same images. Let's demonstrate. So here are the results of Trivi's original scan of the original base image again. And now we're going to scan the SBOM documents we generated before with Trivi. So let's scan the SBOMs Trivi generated for the original base image and our multi-stage build, which had no issues. OK, fair enough. The Trivi scans are consistent with the prior results when we scan not only directly with Trivi, but with the SBOM document. The original image has the same number of findings, and the SBOM is still being fooled by the multi-stage image we built, which, of course, has no vulnerabilities at all. And now, let's look at the original Gripe scan results from when Gripe scanned our original images directly. OK. And then let's scan them again with the SBOM results that were generated by Gripe's partner tool, SIFT. These two tools are designed to work together. They're made by the same vendor. This is a feature that's advertised. So we're going to scan the SIFT-generated SBOM for both our original base and our multi-stage build images with Gripe. And as you can see, they're not at all the same, not even a little bit. That's weird, right? You would think they would be consistent, but they're not. The number of findings Gripe finds from the SBOM generated by SIFT is totally different from when it scanned the original base image by itself directly. That said, the whole thing is still fooled by our zero-finding multi-stage build image, because as you can see, this image has no vulnerabilities at all. So looking at the results of the SBOM scans, we obviously got some surprises there for a few reasons. We would have expected to get the same number of vulnerability results from scanning an image directly or scanning an SBOM of that image. But that wasn't always the case. We'd also have expected to have some indication that a file had been overwritten. We expected that the SBOM would include metadata for every single file, perhaps in the form of a hash. But when, we were, but when reviewing different SBOMs, we found that not all of them do that. Another surprising thing we found is that although these tools allegedly produce an SBOM in the same format, like SPDX, there is no defined standard for how that format gets implemented. So these tools and documents aren't interoperable. If you use one of these tools to generate an SBOM document and feed it into another one of these tools, for example, generate an SBOM with Trivi and have Gripe scan it, or the other way around with SIFT, it leads to unexpected results, or frankly, no results at all. It's even inconsistent when they come from the same vendor, which was surprising too. So we've shown that SBOMs don't capture everything in the image, and we've seen enough interesting behaviors here to suggest that there's more to dig into. SBOMs clearly need more research. We don't have time to cover it all in this talk today, but we have a lot to say. So stay tuned. Coming soon to a KubeCon near you. <laughs> So what can we learn from all this? We've shown that image scanning and SBOM generation tools are quite sensitive to the changes where the metadata from where they get their results. The quality of those results is also directly related to the quality of all of the steps involved in how the image is built. And you can't always determine just by looking at the output that something is off. Because one of these tools generally tend to fail in a way that is pretty opaque. So if you can manipulate the results of these findings, this has potentially significant downstream effects. And it doesn't even have to be done on purpose. Inconsistent results from these tools or their lack of interoperability can cause problems for organizations where different groups use different tools for vulnerability assessment. Many organizations, perhaps maybe even yours, have siloed teams that use different tools and maybe don't communicate very well with each other. If you can't always count on consistent results, it's really hard to know who or what to rely on. Yeah. For example, many organizations use vulnerability scanning results when determining which workloads to admit to their production environments. So if the results can't be trusted, that could be a big problem. 
So here are some things that we think these tools could do better to prevent against attacks like this. One of them is to provide a more restrictive mode where detection coverage is the focus, and at the expense, perhaps, of performance, following things like symlinks, throwing warnings and errors for clearly anomalous configurations, like you found a bunch of files that you can't associate with packages or a particular copy step. A scan that returns no results can be a false negative, and it causes these tools to fail successfully, as we've shown you in, in this case. Defining a consistent standard for using the same fields in generated SBOM document formats across tooling could help these tools become more interoperable and could help their results become more consistent. While we realize that many vendors might not have a lot of incentives to collaborate with their competition, it would make it easier for everybody's users of these tools to trust their results. Also, we've only scratched the surface of potentially malicious techniques. So over time, it would help if the toolmakers adopt a more adversarial approach thinking about how people like us are gonna try and bypass them. So you're watching this and you're like, okay, well that was all cool, but I'm not involved in the development of these tools, so what can I do about this? One recommendation, check for unusual behavior. What are you expecting to see in your environment? Does everything look like you expect? Everyone's going to have different answers to this because everyone's environment is different. Do you know your environment? If you don't, starting to do that would be a good first step. If you do, know what to look for. Are you expecting to have zero CVEs as a result? Are you expecting to have UPX packing or sim links in your build process? If not, that's weird, and you should probably go check out what's going on. You can and should validate all of the inputs and processes for how you build container images to ensure that they are following your policies for what a well-formed artifact might look like so that they can be observed correctly by these tools. And Compliance teams who use these results to assess the security of third-party software that they should be using should pay attention to what's in the image, not necessarily just the output of the tools. Yeah. So when implementing these scanning tools and CI pipelines to enforce policies that block image builds or gate deployments just based on the results, it's important to consider what is being asked of the folks who build and maintain these images. As the number of images grows, the number of scans and results needing resolution increases exponentially. So this directly translates to extra work and development friction for those image builders, which can cause an adversarial relationship to develop with those security teams. And that might be enough motivation to make it so that they choose the approach of malicious compliance like we did today. We're all in this together. And ideally, teams are working with one another to achieve larger goals. So let's talk about that. What are those goals? What problem are you trying to solve? A lot of toil can be reduced by considering your threat model and how these tools fit into it. If you can make policy decisions strategically based on that, your work will be much more effective. This will look a little bit different for everybody because everyone's threat model is different. But if you can place the results of these tools into that context, whatever that context may be, that will help. In some cases, it might be helpful to consider whether or not the problem you're trying to solve can be solved by these tools at all. And I think it's really important to understand what these tools do and what they don't do and how they work. They're not magic boxes. They're pieces of software and they work in relatively predictable ways. When you understand more about how they work, it helps a lot when you try to understand where and why they fail and how you can best use them. Another thing that I think all of this shows is the importance of trust in the supply chain. You know, a quote I like about trust is, a trusted person is someone who has the power to betray you. Tools like scanners and S-bombs assume that you can trust the entity that generated them, and they really can't help you if the people that generated them turn out to be malicious or if they just didn't do things right. I spent a ton of effort lately in, in the tooling to define and improve the security of your infrastructure and supply chains. But it seems like there's still quite a lot of work left for the adopters to figure out how to get all of these things to work for themselves. <clears throat> we are often incentivized to be compliant, but not necessarily secure. And these maligned incentives can make it easier to choose the path of malicious compliance, when what we really need to do is choose the path of security. Security might be the harder path, but it's the right one. And it's one that we can all walk together. 
The effort to improve the security of images and artifacts in our environments is something that each of us has a hand in. So let's go make things more secure together. Oh, and uh, one more thing. Hawk, Hawk the, the planet! planet. Thank you all so much for coming, everybody. Here are some links for the repo and base image for our demos if you want to play along at home, as well as some references that we think might be of interest. If you scan this goosey QR code in the corner, that goes to giving us feedback on this talk. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And if you're in this room, don't leave, because immediately after ours is B Corbs' talk on pod security admission, and I know for a fact that one is going to be a great time. So. Thank you all so much for coming. Come find us if you want stickers, because we have them. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate sure. it.